Okay, Mr. Yeah. Hunt, I really want to thank you for doing this. I appreciate, I know you're a busy man and, um, you know, you've had a lot going on in your life and in your business. And I just want to thank you for taking the time to kind of visit today. Uh, Bill, I'm honored that you'd uh, be interested in taking the time to visit. <laughs> you know, well, I mean, you know, I, I listened to your Hall of Fame speech uh, for the Hall of Fame and and I've watched a lot of uh, video of you getting ready for this conversation. So I'm that really kind of excited dull. about it because okay. I've always <laughs> admired the way you do business from afar. And I just think f the principles you stand on, people are going to appreciate. And I just want to kind of kind of have a general conversation about life and, and what you think, if you're okay with it. That's great. Okay. That's great. Thank you. So I know you've been involved in Dallas. You know, I mean, Dallas is important to you. What What's your view of Dallas? What's, what do you think of the future? I'm very bullish on Dallas. I kind of think we're going to have a really nice ride here, but I'd love to see what you think. Uh, I, too, am bullish on Dallas. I'm an, I'm an endangered species. I'm a native Dallasite. I actually was born here. Yes. Uh, whenever somebody visits, uh, uh, I'm in a visit, and they're from out of town, and it's the first time they've been to Dallas. I love pointing out that Dallas is the largest American, the largest city in the United States of America that has no reason to exist where it exists. So the obvious question is, why, why? does it exist? Tell me why. And the answer is the people. That's the only that it, Dallas exists because of the people who came here and formed it formed it, Dallas as a small community, right. and then it grew, and and all the dynamics of of having really good people with good values, and and we were lucky. Uh, we happened to have a great civic leadership at the time of great opportunity. Yeah. Uh, as with any city, we all we've not always had great civic leadership but, I agree. but right. the great civic leaders came along at times that coincided with a great opportunity you know eric johnson dfw yes the civic leaders when uh the texas centennial uh, uh which was a huge thing when when that occurred and was just one opportunity after one uh example after the other you know one of the things i would say is like uh i came here knowing no one in 1986 and it wasn't clickish it was very welcoming and i think if you add value people embrace you one of my favorite things to do is when new people move here um i meet them and then maybe i'll run into them in a year and like they're coming from california where they're coming from and i've never had anybody say they just don't love the city because it's the people it's always about the people um bill uh, i agree with you totally and uh dallas it just you know, people talk about uh, culture, the, and culture started off, I believe, when people were talking about nations. Yeah. Um, you know, the culture of France, the culture of some other country. Um, and then corporate culture became uh, popular as a yeah. phrase. I think cities have culture. I totally And agree. I think Dallas has a culture that is distinct from any other city. And part of it is, it is a very, very open and welcoming culture. It is. It, it welcomes new people. And I had someone who went to school uh, in Boston um, and uh, lived up there for several years afterwards. And he commented that if you were a young person in business and had an idea, you had to be a fifth generation Bostonian before right. anybody would listen to you. Yeah, it's clickish. In Dallas, my view has always been if I don't care who you are, what your background is, what your age is, if you feel that you have a great idea, yeah. you can probably get into anybody's office. To, I agree. Now, the variable and the question is you may get into the office, how long do you stay there? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so. Right. But, but I do think people are open. And give people opportunity. I, I do. do. I've uh, never seen anything like it. Well, that's the reason that you've had so many great people move to Dallas who are not natives because they 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 were aggressive, they were innovators, they were entrepreneurs, and they knew that the environment that somehow developed in Dallas. There's so much where talent to be. It's crazy, and it stays here, right, and, and it grows on it. It feeds on yeah. It itself. Yeah. Okay, so pandemic. I'm, 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 I'm going to eliminate this question here. I'm hopefully because I kind of think it's behind us. But for me, um, 
it created a little bit more balance in my life. I kind of found like that 30 days when we were all shut down. Like I, I kept going to the office, but I was, um, I, I think I, I got a little bit more balance in my life than I had previous. Was there any, did, and did you get COVID? Do, have you avoided it? Uh, I actually had it, yeah. Yeah, I had it too. I think, it, I, I think almost everybody. But is there anything that, any change in you or your life or your view because of, of, of COVID or the pandemic? There were some small things, uh, but I have to say no major things. But I need to explain that. Um, I'm at a stage in life where I have philosophies on everything. Yeah, we <laughs> got experience. And one of my philosophies is that uh, life for most of us is governed by a relatively small number of principles. In my opinion, principles never change if they are a principle. Totally agree. How a so a principle that's valid today was was valid 100 years ago, mm -hmm. 200 years ago, mm -hmm. will be valid 100 years from now, et cetera. Mm -hmm. What changes is how the principle gets played out. And that's a function of the circumstances that evolve and exist at any point in time. As we've gone through um, COVID, all the conditions changed. Uh, we had to adapt a lot of behavior patterns, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. But the principles, I, I've thought about this in the yeah, past. me too. None of my principles change. No. And uh, so, and there will be conditions that will exist post-COVID that did not exist pre-COVID. Yeah. And so you, uh, the, you adapt to those uh, new conditions, but the principles uh, don't change. One last thing on the pandemic. Um, someone made a comment that I think is really true. In the, if you take a look at prior pandemics or history of pandemics, um, one um, phenomenon is uh, a pandemic will accelerate dramatically the rate of change. And Boy, so, 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 so let me just cite a very simplistic example. Um, and out for ease, twenty uh, the year twenty twenty, just as the pandemic yeah. hit, uh, Zoom existed, the technology existed. I forget, I saw the number, I forgot the number. I think it was being used by seven percent of business, the right. business world. So by twenty thirty, absent a pandemic, Zoom would be used probably by 70, 80 percent of business. Yeah, absent a pandemic, guess right. what happened? Pandemic comes along, and what would have taken ten years in a normal circumstance occurs in a year, right? Because of the pandemic, right? Totally. And you know, one of the things that, like, I tried, I, I watched people try to be predatory during the pandemic, use someone's issue for their advantage versus trying to be relational. And I chose to be relational because it just felt better. And I mean, you know, and it's it's about. Life's about relationships. You're being right? true to your principles. Right, exactly. You stay with them. The conditions so, change. You know, that's my point. It's yeah. just that what you're saying is is that in good times and bad, a person's principles show. Right. It's kind of very, very, uh, very thoughtful. Um, family interests. Like, all I ever know about you is work, 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 work. I mean, I, are you a hunter? Or are you a, I don't think you're a golfer. But, I mean, what, what are your interests outside of work? Uh, they basically all relate around family. Yes. It, um, so it's spending time with people you, you care about. Yeah, and, you know, if it is hunting or something like that, it's you could offer me the most exotic hunting trip in the world. Or if I was going to be there with strangers, I'd have no interest. Right. But you, if you told me I was going to go on a hunting trip with family or very, very, very close friends, yeah. and you told me in advance we would see one animal or catch one fish, I'd still go and look forward to it. Right. Because it's about relationships, yes. right? And it's about being around people you care about. Mm, it is. You know, um, my wife, like if we're at the grocery store, and she'll talk to anybody. And and it's not like I'm not social, but I would rather pour into relationships that matter. I'll mm. be socially friendly. You know, I don't want to be rude, but, you know, we end up going out to dinner with people that were in the line at the, at the Tom Thumb, and I'm going, honey, 
But but I think <laughs> I, I'm with you. I would rather pour my my time into people that matter, right? Or not that the others don't matter, but one that we have relationships. Have, yeah, yeah. And you some, have some intimacy. Exactly. That's what I think. Yeah. Okay. Um, philosophy on leadership, specific values. I've got the five five ta- uh, points of a successful company, and I'm going to get into that. But like, it, it seems to me like yours is all about respecting people and treating them right. But give me your general view on on leadership and, and running a business. Um, well, there are a couple of questions there. So yeah. let me break them down. <clears throat> the, I, want, I, I once heard a lecture on leadership. It is the single best lecture on leadership I've ever heard. In fact, I will, I will, I will say I've not really heard a great lecture on leadership mm-hmm. before, other than this one. And the speaker who spoke for an hour, he, uh, he said, okay, there are three kinds of leadership. And I really believe this. And he was up on an elevated stage, maybe 100 people in the audience. And uh, he figured it out. He said, okay, imagine I've got a marker board behind me. And he, you know, outlined a, a rectangle. He said, now, lower right-hand corner, drew a circle. And he actually, I think he had a marker board behind him. It, it drew a circle, put an A beside the circle. This is one kind of leadership. It's called authority. You're the general in the army. You say, face right, everybody faces right. Mm-hmm. Then you, he went over to the center of the marker board, in the middle up, Drew another circle, put an I behind it. Influence. You have no authority, but you have the ability to explain what you think other people should do and cause them to do what you think, what you want them to do. Example, Martin Luther King. There's a third kind of leadership. He went over to the other side of the marker board and drew a circle and drew a big E behind it. Beside it, he said, "That's ex. That's example, big E uh, example." And he cited an example out of a, a World War II movie. Um, <clears throat> um, the Allied troops need to take a hill in order to get to the bridge on the other side of the hill to blow it up to keep the German tanks from coming in. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there's there's a problem. There's a German machine gun nest at the top of the hill. And the machine gun nest has, has kept 200 Allied troops in a trench at the bottom of the hill. They can't get over the hill. And they've been there for two days. Then, this is the example, it's, it's dusk. You can still see, but you can't see real well. All of a sudden, one of the 200 soldiers jumps out of the trench, doesn't say one word, it's dusk. You can't tell whether that's a private or you can't tell what the rank is. And the one soldier starts running up the hill toward the machine gun nest. And within two seconds or five seconds, 199 other soldiers jump out of the... Follow them. They follow them and they take the nest. They go over and blow up the ridge. The wall, you know. Uh, that's a great example. It is. It, it is. is. And, and now the best leader is take each of those circles, authority, you got the authority, influence, you can articulate why, and you walk the talk. And those circles are right on top of each other. That's a great answer. That's awesome. Uh, How do you protect corporate culture? How do you keep it thriving? Um, Yeah, you made a reference. Um, For some reason, I had a long airplane flight a number of years ago, and I started thinking about what... Are the five part of the characteristics exactly. that separate a truly great company from one that just is merely good, and I ended up with five. And the the first and most important by by far was corporate culture. Right. So, what is corporate culture? Uh, corporate culture, to me, is, cons- corporate culture is a set of shared values and a shared work ethic shared values and a shared work ethic um, and I also believe that if you uh, have a sufficiently large number of people with the same shared values mm-hmm. and the same work ethic 
that um, the laws of physics come to play. I, I was terrible in physics in high school. I remember only one thing, and that is that mass attracts mass. I think that applies to people. And if you have a critical mass of people with shared values and a shared work ethic, they will attract other people with similar values and a similar work ethic. So do you think if one gets in that doesn't have similar values or worth ethic, work ethic, they may pick it up because they're in the middle of all those people? I would hope that'd be the case, but more likely it's the opposite. Yeah. Uh, that they will, they, they will conclude that they really are not comfortable so it's, and, it's and, like kind of like-minded people out. want to be around each other. Exactly. I totally agree with that. And the way you protected uh, uh, two things. One, you, you you talk about it. You say the corporate culture is the most important characteristic of any successful company. And then you've got to walk the talk. Yeah. And uh, but But talking about it is really important because telling everybody that... In our company, we have a culture committee, uh, and it's uh, one third. About, it's about fourteen people, uh, fifteen, and um, one third change each year, mm -hmm. and it'll range from uh, the newest person or somebody maybe yeah. been with the company for four to six months to somebody who's been with the company for 25 years. That's smart. So and, you got a, uh, a blend of yeah, people. Right. And, and very care. And it has no line authority. No line authority at all. But we will meet. We'll meet for two hours over lunch and we'll just talk about things that are happening. You know, how does this feel? What do you... Right. And it's, it's an excellent and just the fact that you have a culture committee yeah shows people you care makes a statement i totally agree to everybody else because like for me uh because I, I read all this before i came in here today and i was thinking about there's been several times as i've been building my company where i didn't feel good about the culture and the more i thought about it while i was preparing for this is it was probably more driven by me than the people because I've evolved into a better leader in person than I was when I was in my 20s and 30s. And it was kind of a, uh, a little bit of a rude awakening for me to kind of just face that because there was a time, like I feel like our culture is really solid now because people, it's about letting people know you love them and care about them, right? And that they matter. Yes. And they're just not a number, which I, which I, it, it just runs over you in everything you say. It's about treating people right. And okay, so like a, ability to differentiate. Everybody's trying to cut themselves out from the pack, right? Tell me about that. Well, <clears throat> there were five um, yeah. uh, characteristics: corporate culture, for in a way, uh, number one. Second is differentiation. Uh, if I'm in the pizza business, yeah, I need to differentiate my pizza from the person next door because I need to convince you that you should pay five dollars more for my pizza because totally my great. pizza is different right. if you can't differentiate yourself then you're average yeah, uh, you're and if you're average the best you know part. third is uh, the uh, ability to adapt to changing circumstances Darwin had it right the uh, species that survives is the one that adapts the best. It's not the strongest, the fastest, the most intelligent, or anything else. It's the one that adapts to changing circumstances uh, the best. And, you know, if there's one thing that is a constant in life, it is that the rate of change it's so fast. is continuing to increase. Well, COVID, right? Adaptability exactly. in COVID was right. huge. And that takes you to the fourth, which I refer to as agility. Because if, if things change and you can figure out what the exact proper adjustments uh, are that need to be made, uh, that's great. But if it takes you 10 years to make the adjustments, you might as well have never had the idea. So I got to tell you, one of the things that drives me crazy, because I think time is risk. I do. I do. I, I really Life can happen, right? And especially in, in today's world, anything yes. can happen in time. And when I get into some uh, situation where people aren't agile, they're not focused on time, you know, they just think it's going to be like this forever. And I just think the world moves quick. And I think you have to be agile. So I totally agree. Yeah. 
I agree a thousand percent. We refer to it internally as event risk. Once we decide we want to do something, or that we are going to do something, go do it. Then <laughs> do it as quickly totally. as possible. Totally. So that something, so that you avoid uh, a situation where something that was not foreseeable mm -hmm. happens that causes you not to be able to do what you're saying. And there have been several really significant things um, in my career where I basically, once we decided to do something, I sort of created a deadline that really didn't exist. But, and and had I not, things would have changed. Right. And those things would not have happened. Totally agree. Yeah. Totally agree. Okay, and now like contrarian. Okay. That's my big one. I love that. Um, I believe that the contrarian, this is the fifth of the five, will be rewarded much more in the future than ever in the past. And the reason is that uh, it, it really comes down to modern communication. It is so much easier today than in the past to um, convey uh, an opinion or a prediction or yeah. whatever and build a consensus opinion. And once you have a consensus opinion that's out there that's been built, people will start making decisions to take into account what the consensus opinion is and and they'll, yeah. they'll compensate. So if you live in North Dallas and the, the consensus opinion becomes that the world's greatest uh, traffic jam is going to occur on North Central Expressway, mm -hmm. guess what? Everybody else, and, it, and it's a consensus opinion, everybody's going to say, I'll figure out some way to get home if you live in the North, um, other than North Central Expressway. Right. Because, well, if everybody figures out some other way to go, how should I go home? North, North Central, Central Expressway. Because totally. there's not going to be anybody else there. Right. But don't you also think that, that having conviction, if you're going in a different direction, because I, I find the herd is usually wrong. I, I do. I agree. I mean, if everybody's running north, I'm thinking, I'm looking south going, what's down here? Because cause, cause the herd, everybody follows. Yep. But it takes confidence and conviction to be different, to be contrarian. Um, there are a couple of elements there. Um, I agree, Bill, completely. Okay. Uh, when we're talking to other people trying to describe our company, we we will affirmatively say if we see an elephant stampede going in a particular direction, yep. you will not see us in the elephant stampede. Right. Uh, conversely, and you, if you're the first ele elephant, you may do okay. Right. Second one may do totally may survive, agree. but everybody else gets killed. Totally. Uh, agree. Alternatively, once we recognize an elephant stampede, we will consciously look the opposite way. And we'll say, can you make a case for doing the opposite of what everybody else is doing? Now, a lot of times you can't, right. and then you don't do it. But sometimes you say, well, gee whiz, you know, I understand why the elephants are going there, but guess what they're leaving behind here? Right. And uh, so the objective is to go where other people aren't. You know, get involved, make your investment, do whatever it is yeah. you do, and then hopefully in several years the elephant stampede is coming around where you've been for several years. Right. I, I've always found that the people in an area where people are most comfortable in real estate, now I'm thinking real estate, where everybody's rushing this way, is when there's the most risk because everybody's pricing it up and everybody's going that way. And when everybody's the most fearful, like times of, of uncertainty is the best time to be bold no question. If, if you find opportunity. Now, you have to layer on top of that risk management. Right. Um, people look at some of the things that we've done and um, <clears throat> will ascribe to the decision as being very high risk. If you really examine it, they weren't high risk. Uh, right. And uh, yeah. that's uh, if in the oil and gas business, and there are a lot of similarities between oil and gas and real estate. Um, but simplistically, if you're ex drilling exploratory wells in oil and gas, simplistically, they say one out of 
10 wells will be successful, nine will not. So you need to make sure that you've done enough where you drill enough wells where the law of large numbers will work for you. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and, but then you, you know on January 1 of any given year, if, if you're true to that model, you're going to drill nine dry holes. You just don't know which dry holes, which, right, wells which one's going to be there. But the one that um, uh, is successful needs to pay for itself it needs to pay for all the development costs of the field that it discovered. And it's got to pay for all of the nine dry holes. Exactly. And then it's got to return a profit above that. Right. And, and with technology today and energy, is it still that kind of odds? I mean, can you actually go drill? If you drill 10, it's still nine whiffs? Um, is it getting better with technology? It depends on the kind of, kind of well you're drilling. If... Uh, the shale plays, which is the horizontal yeah. drilling, yeah. Um, the, the 110 would not apply. Got it. Um, now, if you're trying to discover a new area yeah. uh, for horizontal drilling, right. then it would. Yeah. Okay. All right. So one other thing I've, I've read about is putting quality people in areas where they don't have experience. So I've always been um, a believer in letting somebody go lean into what they're really good at, right? And I kind of think that's what you're doing, but you're just letting them go skin something different than what they're used to skinning. But I would love to hear that theory because that is something I don't think I would have done until I started thinking about this. You know, I wish it, I wish I could say that this was something that uh, I really thought through and had this burning bush yeah, uh, and that's wrong. <laughs> uh, but one day, again, probably a long airplane flight, I started thinking about some of the things that had really worked out well for us, and uh, and and who w were the people that we said, okay, you're the person that we're going to look to to lead this effort, and in virtually every case, the person on paper was not qualified. If you looked solely at the paper, which goes back to the importance of creating an environment that attracts really good people. Mm -hmm. um, if you ask somebody to do something they haven't done before, but your, your gut tells you, that, you know, yeah. I've seen them do this and do it well. I know what their work ethic is. I know what their values are. Part of, you know, it gets into communication, all, all this kind of stuff. Um, and then if, if, it's, uh, if a person's doing something they haven't done before, you don't just give them the responsibility and walk off. You, you, you make sure that you're there, you're, you're observing, um, you're helping when asked. Uh, if you see a mistake about to be made, you say, we need to have a conversation. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and you're always going to make mistakes. And so the question is, how quickly can you identify them and correct them? So, but your theory then is, is that quality person, yes. or a person that that quality person in a in a solid culture is going to figure it out because you know he's a good horse. He's going to he's going to get it done. He or I, she. My favorite it. example um, was the reunion project. Yeah. Um, um, I think I was thirty years old. Stuff like I was in my twenties when we uh, purchased the property. I've seen the pictures. <laughs> not, <laughs> not very pretty, uh, but uh, John Scoville, uh, who I'd gotten to know because uh, we were in the same fraternity, different universities, but they would have a alum active football game. <laughs> so <laughs> that's how you met him. Yeah, that's uh, awesome. I, I was a center and he was quarterback. He, yeah. he, but he was the quarterback and team captain at Texas Tech and you know all I was I played center in high school and I wasn't very good at that and uh, and, and, and the actors beat us because John Scoville threw the ball so hard that nobody could catch it <laughs> That's funny. but uh, when he uh, so we got together and and, and uh, he create he was the first person uh, that uh, I hired um, and we created Woodbine, and um, the first project ended up being Wood, but ended up being Reunion. Um, his real estate credentials. He had gone to Harvard and gotten an accounting degree. 
So he knew nothing about real he estate. He got an MBA. Oh, yes, he did. Yeah. He, he, he had an MBA in accounting from Harvard, came back to Dallas, native of Dallas, went to work for uh, one of the big eight, then big eight, now big wow. four accounting firms. Yeah. Um, and he uh, was on the internal audit team for Trammell Crow. That was his exposure to real estate. <laughs> <laughs> but I knew what kind of guy he was. Right. Uh, a smart, hardworking, really focused on details. Uh, and everything that John Scoville did in real estate, uh, uh, Woodbine just did things differently yeah. than... Yes. And, and do you still feel that way? I mean, if you find somebody that you have a lot of faith in that you know has got that that right ilk or the right person, you still go put them in something they've never done because you think you have faith they'll figure it out. Uh, no, it's probably the, it's probably not. A, I don't uh, get up in the morning and look at the people who I think are really great people and say, you know, who. Can yeah. I, but if there is something that is important and. Uh, we need to structure it because yeah. something that be, was a gleam in the eye that looks like something that could actually happen. Yeah. Uh, and we need to have a leader and a structure. Uh, I will look at you know who are the possible people to lead. And if the person who I think really has those characteristics doesn't have the experience on paper, don't hesitate for a moment. That's awesome. Now, you need to make sure that there's surrounded by other people it's that horrible. can see you right and a yeah. bunch of things like that okay do you have a fa favorite deal type like do you like energy over real estate or it what kind of i mean you seem to be a risk taker i think you're very comfortable with risk from just everything i've listened to and re read about I, I seem like when you see something if someone else perceives it as risky you're fine with it if you believe in it but um do you have a deal type Talk about risk and deal type, then. I, okay, I risk and deal. Uh, they are two questions. Uh, first is risk. Um, one of the, the things that I think has really uh, worked well for us as a company is we are a very risk tolerant and mistake tolerant company. Yeah. Um, and and really, I mean, you want people to have the courage of their convictions, and if they feel that they ought to do X, you know, well, you, you have a couple of rules. Rule number one is you never bet the ranch on anything. Totally. <laughs> There's no deal that good that you, right. um, and um, uh, so risk is uh, the, you know, the, the prospect of losing the money you have put at risk but the real risk management is making sure that the amount of money that you would put at risk would not uh, materially negatively impact you going forward if you lost it all. Mm -hmm. And the way I sort of look at it is, uh, if we're going to do something, let's assume that it's a total disaster sure. and we, we lose it all. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll pay uh, a higher interest rate for a non-recourse uh, loan. So a lot of course. <laughs> We're aligned there. <laughs> totally. Uh, you know, um, if there's a uh, project, it could be real estate or oil and gas, uh, if the 100% cost is X and if we can afford to lose, uh, well, we typically like to have partners because it, it's it's a good discipline. If if I can't convince you to be a partner, then yeah, uh, yeah, but, I totally agree with that. But uh, the amount uh, to which we um, uh, look to partners for will be commensurate with how much we would be not uncomfortable in losing if we lost everything. Yeah, and. Uh, Okay, and do you have a favorite, like, do you prefer, do you enjoy real estate over oil and gas, or is there a, I mean, do you, do you like deals that are real complicated, or do you like the layups? Uh, I kind of like them both. <laughs> no, I, it's been said, I mean, it's true. If we were in the, uh, in the uh, pizza business or the, uh, yeah. you know, 
I wouldn't still be active. I wouldn't be right. Uh, right. Stimulated. So you like challenge. I, the things that I, I I do like a challenge. I do too. Um, uh, the perfect deal mm-hmm. for me is one that does have some complexity to it. Uh, I don't like complexity for complexity's sake. What right. I really enjoy, just psychologically, is connecting dots in ways that are different yeah. than other people. Everybody sees the same dots, but, right, but you see you, can you can you connect them in yes. some different way? Yes. And the third element is I really do believe that uh, um, you know you're put on this earth for some reason you don't know what, and um, I. I would like to feel that the things we do help other people. Right. Make it a better place. Uh, whether it is uh, creating uh, economic real estate development in an area that needs, where the people in that area need uh, the services and the mm-hmm. benefits mm-hmm. that come with that, uh, with energy, uh, the extreme, the, the one that makes most example, uh, the best example of this for us is what we do internationally. Uh, uh, the good Lord, uh, when he, you know, it takes 100 million years and the good Lord to create a barrel of oil. And uh, the good Lord has a uh, sense of humor that uh, I still don't understand because he hides those deposits <laughs> of oil That's in funny. the most unbelievable places. Yeah. But if you find oil or gas, in some godforsaken part of the world, and the standard of living in that area or that country uh, is at a certain level. It because you went there and because you did what you did, and it worked. You have fundamentally changed for the better the lifestyle and the quality of life mm-hmm. for certainly all the people you touch. Right. If not. In the extreme case, the country, yeah. and uh, so that feels good, right? Okay, so um, I've read about your Yemen discovery and um, how it was sourced. So now I think it's something where I'd love to hear the story because it's something about um, you did something right that that allowed this all to happen. But I'd love to hear the story. <laughs> Which what you've heard probably is not accurate. Okay. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to make this a short response. Uh, the we had participated in a discovery of a what ended up being a um, modestly successful uh, uh, offshore oil field off the, off of the uh, Scottish coast. It should have been a much more successful case, but. It became a jobs program for Scotland, so the cost went. Anyway, it caused us to have an office in London. We had one person and an assistant in that office. That person was a Scot. He had many years earlier worked for Conoco, and Conoco, at the time he was there, and this condition lasted for about three years. They had about fifteen or twenty world class explorationists with different disciplines. Uh, Conoco messed things up. They all left. Some went, some became consultants because some went with other companies. This person joined us. One of those people was a consulting, became a consulting engineer. His uh, uh, hobby was archaeology. He went to Yemen because Yemen had just opened up after 500 years of not allowing foreigners to come into the country. Um, and to uh, he spent a half day out of a week going over to the mineral um, ministry of mines. They, Yemen had no oil, zero oil at the time. And he saw an area magnetic survey that had been flown for uh, purposes of mineral exploration. And Yemen did have minerals. The frankincense trail came through yeah. there. Anyway, he had an idea. And he um, came back to London and uh, tried to interest other people, and it could not. And he was a Syrian. The Syrian geophysicist met our person, the Scott geologist, um, for beer in a in a, a, a pub in London, 
and the Syrian geophysicist sketched out on a napkin what he thought might be the case. Yeah. And uh, our guy uh, thought that we had a huge respect for the geophysicist. He called the next day the person in Dallas that he reported to, said, this is the craziest idea that I've ever had, ever passed along. Yeah. Uh, the guy in Dallas walked down the hall to my office and said, Ray, this is the craziest idea I've ever passed along. But he, he went through the background. And my question was, this is a crazy idea. How much would it cost to find out if there's a substance? By international exploration standards, it was dirt cheap yeah. and for multiple reasons. So we went ahead and pursued it. Uh, it ended up being highly successful. And what, it, what happened was when the earth was pulling apart in geologic time, um, there were great pressures uh, between what is now Africa and the Middle East. Yeah. There were three zones of weakness. The first one to fail is now the Red Sea. The second one, which once the first one failed, the pressure was taken off of the other two. Right. But on the surface, it's a great rift valley in Africa. The, there was another one on the other side, on the Middle East side, but it was covered in sand. People couldn't see it. And uh, so that's... The real story of what we did in Yemen was we discovered a basin. We didn't discover a field. Now the basin had multiple fields in it and stuff like that. But so from the from from that call walking in your office to to knowing it worked, how long? A um, year, ten years. It uh, from the time he walked into the office to when we drilled the well mm -hmm. was probably four years. Oh, um, that's great and. Um, and there were probably five different steps we had to. Yeah. Uh, um, and then after we drilled the discovery well, it took three years to drill enough wells to know that we had something commercial and to build a pipeline from the desert over the mountains in So Yemen, you built a pipeline? A pipeline down to the Red Sea. And we had to build a, um, consider a huge, well, a, a pretty large refinery yes. in the desert. Yeah. And when we went in, um, they they didn't even have. Yemen was the poorest country in the in the world at the time, and uh, um, only had a few highways. They had to close down the highway for. So it's put a lot of people to work, right? It's changed it. Oh, it fundamentally changed it. Today, Yemen's a basket case. But it, and it's so sad because the, the the people of Yemen are basically good people. Uh, but they are, the, the people of Yemen are good people. They've had some bad government. I was going to ask if government was good. Okay, so we're on oil. Is this is this run on oil prices going to last a while, you think? Um, okay, we're sitting here in 2022. Um, right. We think that uh, you're going to see elevated oil prices um, and liquefied natural gas. Natural um, gas is finally having its day. Right? Oh, it's been yeah. forever. Um, and we think that's going to happen for at least several years. Right. And um, the reason is um, it, it's not political uh, per se. It, it's a significant underinvestment in uh, major new projects by the mega major oil companies uh, for the last four or five years. And the way oil fields uh, work, uh, it's not like you're drilling a well into a river when you yeah. produce it. You know, it takes again a hundred million years in the good Lord to create that right. barrel. So the industry is called a depleting resources industry. Right. So it's like a treadmill. You produce a barrel of oil, you need to go out and discover a new field right. with uh, um, barrels that will compensate for what you've produced. Um, and the majors have not done that because of stock market reasons. Stock market and pricing? Is it pricing because oil uh, is $30 or no? It really was more... 
uh, originally stock market, but then um, the, the the green movement. Uh, right. And, and in my view, that's got to be helping it, doesn't it? Um, it's causing the price of, of right. oil and gas. Right. You know, we're doing a whole bunch of things within the, our company right now that would be considered green. Uh, we've built wind farms in West Texas. We've got one in Costa Rica. We have a major involvement with um, battery technology, new battery technology. Mm -hmm. There are five or six different things that we're doing Great. that have nothing to do with hydrocarbons. In fact, internally, we refer to it as one area of the company is dealing with hydrocarbons on the energy yeah. side. One area is dealing with electrons. Right. And uh, the electrons are all the green stuff. Um, we passionately believe that the predictions of uh, the things that, we, that will be powered by renewable energy uh, are accurate. Those are accurate predictions. Where we disagree is timing. And, uh, you know, uh, the people would have you believe that all this will happen. They refer to it in the, in the energy industry as trans, the transition period. Right. Um, a lot of people talk about the transition period being a period of three years. It's, oh, going, it's going to be 30 years right. to 50 years. Well, and, I mean, we're going to be dependent on fossil fuels for a long time. Right. The thing that kind of wears me out about all this is, so like we're going with electric cars, and I think all of it's good. I do. I think being more green is important, and I think in taking Great. care of our, our, our world and our country, I think all that's really important. But I mean, you've got electric cars. What do you do with those batteries? I mean, those batteries have got to be disposed of. I mean, there's pros and cons to everything. Now, I've also heard that the electrical grid, if we went to electric cars at the rapid pace that a lot of people want us to, the grid can't handle it. Somebody uh, with one of the majors I was talking to had done a study on this. There are basically, in, in the United States of America, three major grids that yeah. uh, carry electricity, they figure to do what's being talked about now would require building two additional grids. Think about them, uh, that uh, that would be a 10 to 15 year process yeah. and cost a zillion dollars and um, it, it's just impractical. Um, the, um, so a lot of, it will happen, but it won't, you can't force it you can't force a calendar. And do you think if the government turned on, and I don't want to get political because yeah. I'm not getting political, but if the, if if we if they turned back on the rights for local for uh, the states to, to create energy oil, drill for oil, could then could the pricing adjust like it did when when the last administration kind of um, was fine with it? I mean, there's got to be a little bit of a middle ground there where you could moderate oil prices. The price is set. This is Economics 101. Right. The price is set by uh, supply and demand. Right. And uh, oil, the price of oil is set globally uh, because you put oil on a ship and ship sure. it anywhere. So the variable is the transportation cost of how far you have to ship right. it. Uh, natural gas used to be set, uh, and most of it still is, set on a regional basis because mm -hmm. you can't put natural gas on a ship. You can, but where you have a pipeline system, you can put it in the pipe and get it from point A to point right. B, but you'd have, but you're still confined by the geography where the pipeline is. Now what's happened in the last 10, 12, 15 years is the advent of liquefied natural gas where you super cool uh, regular natural gas, make it a liquid, put it into a ship, they treat it like oil, it can go to a, a place with a, a, an offloading terminal, and you offload the liquid, raise the temperature, it becomes a gas again, and then you put hmm. it into the uh, gas, the pipeline system of that area. And that's what's happening in Europe today. Because uh, like natural gas has been unbelievably cheap for a long time, yes. and now it's. Well, I don't and, know why we don't figure out how to have cars work on natural. So, 
what what it, it's it is uh, the political aspects of it uh, uh, if 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 restrictions were eased my view is put every kind of governance thing you want to to make sure that a uh, oil and gas company is being responsible and right. safe and right. not polluting and right. stuff like that. Right. But let them do their thing. Right. And uh, the amount of oil that you'd have, certainly in uh, Alaska, but let's go to the state of California. Right. It's huge. But but you've got to get permission from the city council. and uh, It's never going to happen. It's never going to happen. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I, I'm too short to even try, yeah. right? Yeah, we have made a conscious decision. We will never try to do anything well, in California. Yeah. Right. I, in real estate, I don't think so either. Yeah. Because yeah. it's, I mean, it's just too cumbersome. I mean, yeah. they tax you, and they, if you're going to do it, you have to keep it forever. You, yeah. It doesn't make any sense to go in and be a trader. Okay, so difference between real estate and energy on uh, risk. Um, risk is the same. Um, so you'd say it's the same. I would say uh, the major uh, similarity, and I think uh, real estate and oil and gas exploration are extremely similar because they both uh, require uh, imagination and guts. creativity. And some guts. Um, if you take a look, yeah, willingness to take risk. Um, you know, people with oil and gas, Nobody has ever seen an oil field. Uh, you may drive down the highway and you may see the equipment at the surface of the earth yeah. Yeah. below which yeah. an oil field exists, but yeah. the oil field may be 10,000 feet down. Yeah. Nobody's ever put their eyeballs on it. Right. Uh, you've seen the equipment. Um, and so the explorationists who discovered that field or the team, they had to visualize what could exist that they can't see so and taking whatever data points right. they had that's the same thing for a successful real estate developer the real estate developer needs to say okay here's a piece of uh, land that's never been developed or a piece of land that needs to be redeveloped what could I do here what that do? what would the market uh, expect and respond to and what does the market need all those are subjective uh, questions and decisions so in both cases you have to be creative intuitive imaginative etc that's how they're so similar the biggest differences uh, are referred to as the uh, visibility of failure uh, <laughs> this is my favorite it, um, you heard me at the yeah. Speech. Um, anyway, uh, but but it's so true. Um, in oil and gas, uh, you can drill uh, the most expensive dry hole failure in the history of the industry, and if you're in some godforsaken part of the world or out of West Texas in some place that nobody ever drives by, it could be the most expensive failure in the world. At some point, you, you quit drilling and you say, this is the most expensive failure in the world, and but you, you pull the pipe out, you move the rig off, you uh, pour 500 sacks of cement in the, in the top of the uh, well, the hole. You weld a metal plate on top of it. You come back in six months, weeds have grown, grown over, and yeah. nobody knows yeah. that that is the site of the world's yeah. biggest failure. Alternatively, at a fraction of the cost, if you go out and build the world's ugliest office building at the um, you know exit uh, the entrance of, to the North Dallas Tollway or Central Expressway or yes, any sir. other freeway, yes sir, and uh, it's the world's ugliest building. Every time you drive by it, you will be reminded. Oh my God, of that's how, a nightmare. Yeah, and, and all your friends, I'm sure, will also remind we'll never you. Forget, and, and, never let you forget and, it. And your banker will probably not be real pleased either. Oh, that's so <laughs> funny. Because I have to tell you, when I heard, heard your, because I'm prepping for this, I heard that, that story, and I just said, it is so true. You know, because like, one of the things I really like about developing is creating. And I always try to be out front instead of follow 
And, you know, there's risk in being out front, right? Because you can be wrong, but, but you know, like wrong location or wrong design. And I mean, because we've all seen buildings where somebody let an architect run wild and yep. it's, you know, it's sitting there and you're going, what the hell are they thinking? But yeah, well, the, the extreme case for us was Reunion Tower. Oh, the, 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 think about that. Yeah. There was nothing like that. I think it's cool. That's, you know, well, for I mean, it's gutsy too. Fortunately, Conviction. fortunately, we were pleased. We we are, fortunately we are pleased yes. <laughs> with how people have uh, grown to love it. But there there were evenings when I was at, uh, as it was going yeah, out, yeah. where I said, "Ooh, what happens if everybody doesn't like it?" Right. <laughs> you know? Which you know the thing about that development that I'm impressed with is the size. Because at your stage in your life, and when you were doing that, that is a massive hotel. And that is, it, it took conviction. It did. It took conviction to build it. Because I've been in and out of that facility, and it's very well done, in my opinion. And I think it took total belief in, in what you're doing and your team to, to make that big a step. There were a lot of stages and causing that to come about and a great many people involved and uh, yeah. but once again uh, the capital we had at risk when um, you know people look at the project now um, oh my god what it cost then versus now is like but it was still a lot of money then you want me to go through that story sure okay um, the um, the way we came to buy uh, the land that is now reunion, which is such a deal. Um, it had, uh, it really was four separate parcels, and um, it had been shopped all over town. Nobody had any interest in going through a bankruptcy. In fact, we bought it out of a bankruptcy court, and um, um, and the reason nobody had bought it were the four parcels, which. Uh, all were irregularly shaped. You couldn't have developed anything on any of those parcels because they've been uh, the configuration was a result of right of ways, of, of highways, yeah. uh, railroad tracks, stuff like that. Um, and but the price uh, was at three dollars and three cents a square foot, ten percent down, ten years interest only. 10 years principal and interest after that for a 20-year note, all non-recourse. And so when I saw that, I was the last person that was on, I'm sure at the bottom of the list of the broker. And uh, uh, I looked at it, and this is over about a week, and I said, you know, there's a reason that nobody has had any yeah. interest in this because nothing to do with it but then I said and T.I. had just come out and just developed a calculator <laughs> tells you how long ago it was and I uh, pulled out my, my calculator I said okay if we bought this at three dollars and three cents ten percent down and uh, held it for 20 years uh, what would our basis be something like five dollars and 25 cents something like that and i said okay what are the odds of something good happening in dallas in 20 years totally that would cause it to be worth more than five dollars and 25 cents that was the only logic very basic and, and so the amount of capital risk was really quite small right. then several years later the city buys union station and with it 30 acres of land that uh, surrounded it. It was all used by railroads. Yeah. We go to the city, and it's a long story. I'm really cutting it short here, and say, "We'll here's a proposal. If we'll pay 100 percent of the cost, we'll put together a planning team approved by you all, mm -hmm. and we'll say to the planning team, here's the property the city owns. Here's the property we own. Your property's not developable. Ours not developable. Let's give the planning team." the list of things that we both would wish to see down there, ask them to go off, come up with a land plan and accomplish as, as much as can yeah. be accomplished without, with you all paying no attention to the property lines. Just, you know, and a hotel was on our list. 
uh, the old reunion arena uh, was on the city's list right. and the, multiple things like that. They came back, the planning team came back with a land plan. We tinkered with it about 10% and then negotiated a deal with the city over four months that was probably four inches thick, which we agreed to do. Land swaps. Yeah. The city used to own half the land under, underneath hmm. uh, the hotel, Hyatt Regency. We used to own one half the land under Reunion We're, Arena. Yeah. Where, so we traded. Perfect. You know, and it, it's turned out to be a phenomenally good deal for the city and a very good deal for us. Yes. Okay, so is there, what is, what's the most visible opportunity that you see out there right now that no one's taking advantage of? Do you <laughs> see anything out there that you just go, why isn't somebody doing this? Um, I don't see it right now. Right. Um, you know, there are things that um, I, I say I wish I'd seen earlier. Mm -hmm. um, I wish I'd seen yeah, I the uh, growth, the, ex the explosive growth north of uh, Frisco to yes. uh, um, the, county, the state line. Um, I have, the conventional wisdom is that uh, if you go east, um, that uh, for, and drew a line from Rockwall to Terrell, yeah. that to the west of that line, you'll have the opportunity for great residential and, yeah. and associated commercial yeah. development, but not further east. Mm -hmm. The further east might be uh, uh, attractive or warehouse developer or something yeah. like that. Um, that could be an opportunity. Yes. Um, I like that. Because the conventional wisdom is too too far. And right. Yeah, go against it. Right. Okay, so what about um, young young person wanting to get started in business? Any yep. Very, advice? Uh, yes. Uh, and periodically I'll be asked by SMU to come out and talk to yeah. some um, <clears throat> The most important things uh, I would say for a young person entering the marketplace or recently in yeah. the marketplace. First, your uh, formal education does not stop when you get your sheepskin. No uh, at a minimum, it will extend until, uh, well, never, your education yeah, you never ends. But you should do everything you can to expand your uh, options. And simplistically, I'll say, you ought to have expanding your options as your primary uh, focus until, until you're at least age 30 yeah. because the calendar is the calendar. And every decision you make after age 30 is going to cause your options to decrease. You'll decide, are you going to get married or are you not? Right. Well, are you going to have children or are yes. you not? What city are you going to live in? What industry are you going to be in? All those decisions... Even if they're all totally correct, let's assume they are. But if you pick one, that means you're making a negative decision on all the other alternatives. Totally um, true. So, um, and then for a younger person, I'll say, if you, uh, once you leave the classroom and go to work, uh, simplistically, if you have two options, one is with a very well-established, large firm, great job security. Uh, but you're going to be with a whole bunch of other people. Yeah. And uh, um, and the other is the equivalent of a startup or a very small company. Mm -hmm. And you, your job description really doesn't mean that much. I mean, when you show up in the morning, if a job needs to get done, you're likely to be thrown into that. Yeah. Way. And it pays one half of what the large uh, go with the small company. I totally agree. Get yeah. out over your skis. Yeah, exactly. And uh, look for opportunities where advice. you're given authority. And uh, look for opportunities to be with people who can be your mentors, even if they do not officially 
right. claim to be a mentor or, right. or strive, but people that you want to be with, that you admire, respect, and can learn from. I think that's awesome. Okay, so like when you're done, what's important to you that you've accomplished or, you know, how you've left the world or is there anything that kind of drives you? Because, I mean, it's not money, right? It's about... You, I mean, you get up and it's about accomplishing things, I would think, but at, at your stage in your career, because you've accomplished so much. But what is it that, that's important to you there on, from your business career? Um, the, the things that are important to me, um, you know, I get hit by a truck going home tonight. Right. I would like to feel that... Uh, uh, I hope it's St. Peter. It could be somebody else. But if, I'm going if you go up Central, way. it's going to be empty because everybody <laughs> thinks it's it's, it's right. <laughs> going the other way. Um, but um, I would want to make sure that uh, in a perfect world that I've taken care of my family and my loved ones and the people I care about, right. which includes all the people in our company. I right. mean, that we, we are an extended family. Right. Um, I would also like to feel that the world's a slightly better place because right. I exist. Right. And that's pretty much it. Yeah. Like for me, it's like I worry about the people that work for me. I want to make sure because if I get hit by a bus that they're going to be fine. Yeah. And, you know, my family, I want to make sure that they're directed properly and, and, and taken care of. I really want them to know I love them and it matters. You right. Know? And I feel that way about my employees. But... Well, um, you have been unbelievable, very open. I can't tell you how much I appreciate you taking the time, but um, I just really, really, really appreciate well, you doing this. Well, I've enjoyed it. You, you've been awesome. Well, no. I, I mean, you're so easy to talk to, and, and you've accomplished so much, and, and you, um, it's just great the way you share, and I appreciate it. Well, you had great questions. My, my answers were not as good as your questions. Oh, but, yes, they were. They were but awesome. I, but I enjoyed it. All right, thank you. Thank Bye. you.